time to look at the glow curve report from the albedo dosimeter that I was wearing both in Chernobyl as well as in Brazil. I don't have an albedo dosimeter anymore as it belongs to the government agency that does the radiation monitoring on reactor personnel but also on me for the purpose of visiting Chernobyl in Brazil. So uh, I'll put in a picture here and you can see that the albedo dosimeter has little holes that are suitable for the detector. The detector just looks like this. This is a ring dosimeter, thermoluminescent ring dosimeter, but instead of just having one detector, the albedo dosimeter has four detectors, two lithium fluoride detectors that contain lithium isotope 6 that is sensitive to neutron and gamma radiation, and two detectors, lithium fluoride with a lithium isotope 7 that is only sensitive to gamma radiation. So by telling the difference between the two, you can actually tell apart a neutron from a gamma dose. Further on, it is also sensitive to high energy beta radiation. If you want to know more about the albedo dosimeter, just take a look at the video description. There's the link uh, where I'm explaining the thorough details. But for now, you just need to know that the albedo dosimeter, those little thermoluminescent dosimeter crystals, need to be heated. These little crystals are removed and then are heated and the resulting glow, the luminescence from them, will result in a dose reading eventually with the proper calibration factors applied. First of all, it will be a reading in Coulomb and by calibra applying calibration factors it will be uh, translated to your dose in sieverts, well, micro or milli sieverts usually. And, um, and these calibration factors depend on the fields of radiation that you work with. Uh, for example, uh, typical cesium-137 is pretty easy to have calibration factors for, or for, for example, for reactor personnel. Uh, you just basically you need to know what kind of energies of especially gamma radiation you're working with in order to apply the proper calibration factors. And uh, what you also need to know is about reading the dosimeters. Uh, as I said, they are thermoluminescent, so when heated, they will give off a, a glow that will result in a reading that can be converted to a dose. So, of course, you can work in an environment with, like, let's say, 15 degrees Celsius, and then in summer you work in 35 degrees Celsius environments, and that, of course, results in the erasal of some of the, the stored energy that would result to a dose. So, what is actually done is that these little crystals are preheated to a certain amount and only then the dose is red. Of course some dose that is actually on there from ionizing radiation is lost but that's also why the calibration factors are applied to make up for that basically but to also make sure you rule out just temperature differences that will result in uh, messing up the dose reading. So that's a very important to know and I'll tell you why. So this is uh, the dose reading from Brazil. You can see date here and uh, as I said there are four individual crystals and you can see that we have a dose of 483 microsievert, 400, 549 microsievert, 505 microsievert and 423 microsievert on these little thermoluminescent dosimeter crystals. Yeah, they are in different locations, just slightly apart, but still it results in a different dose, so you usually take an average and uh, consider that the proper dose reading. Also, what you can see here, to the left of the spectrum, um, the perfect glow curve would look like this, but you can see to the left of the spectrum there's a little bit left from, well, not so ideal stuff, from from not ideal preheating, let's say, but that's that's totally normal to occur. And if there was something like this, like not a, not a flat decrease, but something like this, a shoulder that would look like this, that would be a neutron dose. Well, this on this side, on the left side, that's not neutron dose. It's just random stuff that can be ignored. But if there was a shoulder on the right side that would look like this, that would be a neutron dose. But as you can see both in Brazil as well as in Chernobyl, we do not have a neutron dose. This is just because of the different scaling. You can see the scaling in uh, intensity in nanoamperes is at 1 here and there. It's actually at 4, 
five, six, something like this. So this is due to different scaling. So it's it's not really a neutron dose here because that would look like this more, not not a flat thing like this. So um, what is important to note that on the Chernobyl dosimeter you can see this thing here, this large shoulder, which is, as I said before, due to improper preheating. So what you need to do is you need to change the region of interest to actually have the proper shape like this. And this has been done. And you can see this is the proper region of interest for the proper dose reading. And that would be, in theory, 89.7 microsievert for this area, just for one of the detectors. And you can see, and otherwise, you can see that with the total region of interest we have a dose of like 200, 190 microsieverts and stuff like that. And this is an improper dose. Um, there's a little bit of that shoulder in the Brazil dose as well, but the Brazil dose in general is much higher, so it's not as much importance as this. And as I said, with the correction applied, it's about 90 microsievert for this perfect curve, but as there was a little bit in the Brazil curve as well, we could say, we could assume an average of 110 microsievert, oh I can actually do this properly because I'm writing it with my hand, 100 microsievert for the Chernobyl dosimeter versus Brazil. Now we're gonna have to see, you can see that we have like, well, 550 here, 500 something, 480, let's let's say 500 for uh, for the Brazil would be, would be an average we could assume, so 500 microsievert for Brazil. With Chernobyl, it's pretty well calibrated, as uh, in Chernobyl, you know what radiation you were expecting. You were expecting basically cesium-137 radiation. Well, in Brazil, um, now there was a field of, well, the thorium that was present, and they did not have any calibration factor for it, so they told me that it's a plus-minus 20% for, for this reading, actually, because they did not have the proper calibration factors for that. So let's assume that the reading is too high and uh, we're estimating 400 microsieverts as a total dose for Brazil, which is saying, okay, it was 20% too high. But then what we also have to consider is the flight to Chernobyl. It was very short. It was just, uh, well, probably less than 10 microsieverts. So with the flight, it would probably still leave us with 100 microsieverts received in total. Well, in Brazil it was a really long flight and there's also the so-called South Atlantic Anomaly, which exposes you to much more radiation, so we can easily assume 100 microsievert for the flight. So, that would result to a dose of 300 microsievert in total. So, that has the proper calibration. We don't really need to subtract anything from this dose, but for the flight it's well, about 8 microsievert actually to Kiev and back from Berlin. So uh, it's about 100 microsievert in total. Brazil, no proper calibration factor, so we're assuming a uh, 20% too high dose. So 400 microsievert as a dose, minus 100 microsievert for the flight, is a dose of 300 microsievert for Brazil, 100 microsievert for Chernobyl. I was in Chernobyl for pretty much exactly two days, staying at the town of Chernobyl, which is just about maybe 20 kilometers south of the nuclear power plant. And uh, I was in the ex exclusion zone quite a lot, maybe, don't know, if, I don't know, 10 hours, 12 hours? Yeah, 12 hours to say, the to, to say the least. I was walking the Red Forest, which had a couple of hundred microsievert per hour reading, but just for a few minutes. And uh, then I was also playing with the fuel fragment, but the inverse square law applies, and I did not really receive a very high dose from that, and especially no neutron dose, as we saw. And in Brazil, I was for 2.5 days, roaming around freely, spending a lot of time on the beach, of course, not as much time as, uh, as the usual tourist spends on the beach, because I had to walk around and, well, do a lot of stuff for the documentary I was hired for. But you can see that in Chernobyl I received much less of a dose than in Brazil for about, well, staying a little longer in Brazil. So if you want to be absolutely correct, you, will, you could assume 240 microsievert for two days of Brazil, while just 100 microsievert for two days in Chernobyl, 
while I played with a fuel fragment, walked the red forest and pretty much carelessly played with anything radioactive I could find while in Brazil. I was just behaving like the normal tourist. Which is also interesting because in Chernobyl, you remember, people called me totally crazy. Don't touch this stuff, don't step on the moss, don't do anything of this. Total dose, 100 microsievert in two days. Brazil, which is everybody, was on the beach and everything like that. Total dose in two days, 240 microsievert. If I had been on the beach like a lazy tourist reading my book all day, it probably would have been three times net dose. Quite interesting, I say. Incorporation. Okay, incorporation, yeah, that's that's true. Incorporation might be an issue, especially if I just play around with it. There's uh, a lot of cesium-137, which is uh, the main cause for the dose, actually. And if I incorporate that, it behaves like potassium in my body, which means it migrates to my muscle tissue and stays there with a half-life of a few months. That is the biological half-life. The physical half-life of season 137 is 30 years. The biological half-life is just a few months. But then there's also the thing, okay, of course, this is, this is more dangerous than just some random thorium, of course, because the body, well, doesn't really use the thorium and it's not really an airborne particle or anything. But then there's the thing that in Brazil, there's more to the thorium decay chain than just that. It's not just thorium-232. There's the whole decay chain and, for example, there's radium. Now, radium, thorium is 222. Which radium isotope was it again? Yeah, I think it's radium. No, that's, let's check, actually. So, in the thorium decay chain, it's radium-224, actually. Sorry about that. Radium two to four in the decay chain and I had it analyzed as you can see in my previous video about the dosimetry of Brazil. There's about uh, 7,800 decays a second or Becquerel per kilogram of that sand. And you know if your child drops like a banana, maybe a piece of banana into that sand, it will pick it up again, it will eat it. And there's 7,800 Becquerel per kilogram of radium-224 in uh, the, the monazite sand that is just free to, freely laying around on the beaches of Brazil and you can ingest it and radium, why am I mentioning radium out of all the things in the decay chain here? Because radium behaves like calcium in the body, it's the same group of elements in the alkaline earth metals and thus it migrates to the bone, irradiates your red bone marrow, for example, which produces your blood cells. You probably heard of leukemia associated with that because this is actually radium behaves like the strontium 90 that is also associated with, well, reactor fallout as we call it. And um, yeah, that's pretty much the same stuff that stays in your body like this as well and everybody's carelessly handling it. While well, they say it's totally crazy to ingest the cesium from the Chernobyl. Hmm, why? Sadly, I could not bring a sufficient quantity of the cesium 137 contaminated soil from Chernobyl to have it analyzed exactly in the activity in Becquerel per kilogram, but this is just about 8 kilo Becquerel per kilogram. And in the uh, soil and the exclusion zone of Chernobyl, there's like, a, from from what I heard, around 100 kilo Becquerel per kilogram. But, well, I think that in the exclusion zone of Chernobyl, the usual person is much more unlikely to randomly pick up soil and eat it by, for example, dropping food, because eating in the exclusion zone is not permitted anyway. While on the beaches of Brazil, I mean, if you would go there for a holiday, would you know that it is contaminated? with radioactive material, uh, a tenth of what you can find in the soil of Chernobyl of a nucleid that behaves in a, well, dangerous, if you want to put it that way, uh, for your body, that uh, actually has a biological, as a biologically active substance, it behaves like calcium. So in theory, as of, uh, if, you, if you consider Chernobyl to be a total exclusion zone, you should be very careful, you should be wearing protective gear when going in and everything, then you should definitely do the same for Brazil. And if you don't do the same in Brazil on the beaches, then you should reasonably not do it in Chernobyl either, because you can contaminate yourself with uh, a large amount of radioactive substances, both in Chernobyl as well as in Brazil. I leave it to you to judge if that is, well, 
not dangerous or dangerous or beneficial or whatever to your health. But the fact is that both is a high contamination hazard. And if you behave like a crazy person, bathe on the beaches as much as you can, or play with nuclear fuel as much as you can, you still, according to my dose report as you can see, get a lower dose from two days in Chernobyl than from two days in Brazil. It's a two to three fold lower dose from spending your time in Chernobyl and laying on the beautiful tourist beaches of Brazil. And as I said, there are substances that have a biologically significant effect as well, that have a very long half-life in your body, in both, it's not just the thorium. So, what to make of that? Well, I'll leave it up to you for now. I'm looking forward to your comments. Thank you for watching.